What is up? I hope everybody is having a beautiful Thursday night. And I hinted on the community tab that there was a change coming on Thursday nights. That is right. Every Thursday going forward, I will be joined by my guy from Clutch Jeans Sports, Marco Martinez. This is a show that we've been trying to get off the ground for a while. Schedule-wise, it didn't make sense until recently. And here we are to get it cracking. That being said, there's tons to talk about. We're going to talk mainly about the sleepers in this year's draft, players to avoid at 31. And then we got to talk a little bit about the new San Francisco 49er and what does that mean? Maybe how does it impact the draft? We're going to talk about those things plus more next. All right, welcome back to Last Second Sports. We are giving you our take down to the last second. And as I said, Thursday's new edition, Marco Martinez from Clutch Gene Sports. Marco, my guy, how you doing? How's it going, bro? It's been a, been a long time in the making. I know we've been trying to figure something out, but finally um, we're able to do it. So every Thursday, here we are. Yeah, absolutely, man. We have been talking about this. It feels like probably at least a year. And it's just never made sense up until now. You had some scheduling things. I had some scheduling things, but here we are. This is the new Thursday show. I'm looking very forward to this, carrying through the off season and then into the new season as well. This is one I'm excited about. All right, Marco, the 49ers, speaking of excitement, Rakia Sin signed with the San Francisco 49ers today on a one year deal what do you think about rocky sin as a player i mean he's bounced around in the league he was highly touted coming out of college i believe out of temple um senior bowl he had a good senior bowl i remember that because that was a year the niners were there so everyone was focused in on who's going to be a guy to take from that senior bowl they obviously ended up taking debo um but i definitely look at rocky sin as a guy who is going to come in and compete for that starting outside job ambry thomas man that guy is going to be battling his behind off just even be on the team um but even if you look at it i think the niners truly found out where their weakness was it's the secondary they're going and they're addressing it in free agency which is a great thing but it affects the draft in in plenty of different avenues now first round draft pick doesn't necessarily have to be a cornerback they don't have to go reach for a first or second round corner um so essentially i think they're gonna go best player available throughout the draft now that if you look at it um, they addressed corner. They addressed, um, I believe, linebacker with Devondre Campbell, defensive line. So there's no true 100% need. So this is great going into the draft. If you're a draft con like lover, this is extremely what you want your team to be able to go into the. And that sounded pause. That sounded this just that sounded gross. <laughs> uh, but if, but if you love like the draft, like you want your team to go into the draft having no needs. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, what's interesting is the needs for me are future needs. They're not yeah. 911. They got to have them this year necessarily. Although I think that we would all agree we would prefer a really good starting corner if that was possible and maybe an upgrade at the offensive line. But ultimately, the needs are for the future. There's 39 unrestricted free agents. That's a number that I've said it feels like a million times now, but I'm going to make sure that everybody knows. That there's 39 unrestricted free agents next year. That is a big deal. As far as Rocky Sin goes, and I want to get to this comment here, just because, yes, this highlight did come out today, but people have to understand that these are one-on-one -on -one drills. One-on-one -on -one drills are meant for the wide receiver to look good. They just are. When, it, when If you go to training camp and you watch one-on-one -on -one drills, I think last year I charted something like 59 one-on-one -on -one drills, and five of them were won by the defender. Like the the one-on-one -on -one drills are meant for the offensive player to look good and to basically just show off what they've got available to them. It's very, very tough for a defender to win that. But that being said, and that's also why I've been touting Jalen Graham because he was the one consistently winning those somehow, some way during training camp last year. But when it comes to Rocky Sin, he's floated around the league a little bit. He was a, a pretty good prospect coming out. 
Hell of a name, by the way. Hell of a name. <laughs> but I watched a lot of Ravens. You know, my son's a Ravens fan. He filled in admirably last year. And if you go look at his numbers, really one catch changes everything for him. There was one catch. I think it was one catch for 71 yards against the Steelers that he was credited for giving up. But if you go look at that play, it was about a maybe a skinny post 15 yards or so down the field. The receiver caught it and, and took off, taking it to the house. But really, that was on the safety. But of course, he was the closest defender, so it's credited to him. Ultimately, you can't really look at numbers. It was a small sample size. But I think between him, Yadam, Thomas, they're going to be dueling it out for sure. And, and you're right. I mean, Thomas is fighting for his life, but this is the NFL. I mean, he's going into what? Is this year four year for him? Four. Year four. Yeah. You got to figure it out. You got to figure it out. I don't. I think ultimately, the guy that I like the most out of all of them is Rock Yesen. I like him more than, than I do Yadam. I know a lot of people are bigger on Yadam. He's coming off of a, a much better year statistically. But that's the only time he's really shown something. Rocky Sin has shown me something in a couple of his seasons. Yeah. I think ultimately, though, all of these guys are kind of, they're just one-year fillers. Most like, likely, none of them are going to be here next year. But if you look at it, like those one-year fillers are exactly what the Niners need. Like They don't have yeah. an immediate need at corner. And the way that his draft plays out, like that round three to four is the perfect sweet spot for corners to go like guys like cam hart i know you're high on jack uh kyrie jackson out of oregon yeah um you're looking cam at other guys. too i'm very high on cam hart so like when you're looking at it like there's a lot of talent within those th rounds three to four at corner so i definitely like the niners finding fillers because these are guys that aren't necessarily 100 guaranteed to make your roster a guy like rocky sandy autumn their cap isn't drastic where it's like oh oh geez we we need to keep them on the roster because of cap purposes. Nah, if they, if, for example, if they draft um, DJ James or Cam Hart, but Ambry Thomas is looking great in camp, they're gonna keep obviously Ambry Thomas because he's a guy they drafted and he's he's doing well. So I don't necessarily see this as a hundred percent guarantee to make the roster. Now they're all battling for a spot, and I think they have the upper hand on Ambry Thomas since he hasn't been consistent. But I want to see guys like. We have not seen the Raul Luter. We haven't seen Samuel Womack. I want to see those kind of guys. Like those were the guys that you drafted to be the future. And essentially, they're kind of hedging their bet. Like they keep telling us on every pick they've made, linebackers, tight ends, their corners they've drafted. They're essentially telling us, you know what? We have not drafted well in the past at these positions. We have to get a one stop filler so we could draft guys at these spots. And it's kind of concerning, to be honest with you. It's, it's kind of concerned me. And there's a way I look at the Niners drafting, and they have not drafted well. Even though they have a ton of talent on their team, they have not drafted well. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's ultimately multiple ways that you can look at how they've drafted. I had a chart deal that I did the other day. I think you were in the chat, so you probably saw it. But it's tough. I mean, I think that round one has been so bad for them that it kind of overshadows what the rest of the draft has looked like. Because if you look at it from just a pure aspect of how they've been the rest of the rounds, for the seven rounds, they've been pretty elite in, but most of those are later rounds, right? And that's what makes it tough. You expect to hit big time on, on round one, round two guys. And because the 49ers haven't necessarily hit home runs in those rounds, the, the mental or the thought process is, oh, they haven't had good drafts, but they have had good drafts it's just not in the rounds that you would expect it and then how long can that go i you know one thing that you and i have discussed in private and i've discussed it here on the show as well which is we don't know i mean adam peters we we think we have an idea of what he brought to the table but it's it's really tough to say i'm curious to know if adam peters is a big reason for the success in the later rounds the way that we assume and if that's the case if that tradition is not going to stay the same they have to hit in these early rounds. They can no longer have these busts. You can't be taking third round kickers, tight ends, running backs that aren't going to be on the team in a couple of years. They have to hit in these early rounds, especially now more than ever, because this team is going to change drastically over the next couple of years. 100% agree. All right. The other news before we get on to our other topics, Brandon Ayuk and his Instagram posts again cryptic posts 
you want to explain to the people what he posted today? So, yeah. So Brandon Ayuk decides to go on Instagram. It's like a quick little Instagram reel. And as as he has been doing in the past, he's been putting out some cryptic messages. And he decided to put dog emoji, house emoji, which is dog house, right? That's what, what it stands for. Dog house only place for a big dog. I'm, I thought that was interesting. Like, how do you truly like interpret this the way I interpreted it? And I and I texted to you. I was like, I honestly saw it as uh, Kyle put me in the in the dog house because he knew that's the kind of dog I am. Like, I the only kind of dogs that could come out are the big dogs. He understands that. I don't think it has anything. I know a lot of people keep saying it's it's a message short to Cleveland for the dog pound. No, I think it's truly just him saying, you know what? I'm a big dog. I understood what I had, why I got put in the doghouse. I don't think there's much to it. Um, I was joking with Jesse earlier. And I was like, honestly, the way I initially saw it was like, I'm the big dog here. Kyle Shanahan, the Chihuahua. This is my house. Like, I'm going to get extended. Like, don't even trip. That's how I initially saw it. Like, it's. Yeah. The, you know, the interesting thing about Brandon Ayuk in this whole process, a little bit. A, a lot of bit different than how Debo handled the situation for sure. But this is not the first time he's hinted towards that year number two in the NFL where he was put in the proverbial doghouse. Something that at first we didn't know if it was true. The more stories came out, it did seem to be very true. And then he's pretty much confirmed it all off season. But when he was on with Ocho Cinco and Shannon Sharp, he talked about how he's been a consummate pro since day one. He wanted to make that clear. I think he holds a little bit resentment towards being in the quote unquote doghouse. Not anything that's going to stop him from signing or stop him from wanting to be a 49er or any of those things. I think he's just in his mind. He's not technically signed yet. So he's kind of free to get his story out. And this is his way of doing it without completely burning bridges. Like, listen, I've always been a, a, an elite pro. I've always worked my butt off. Yes, I'm the fourth option, but don't get it twisted. If I'm the number one guy the way that I believe I should be and the way that I've worked to be, I'm elite in this league. And I think that e at every turn, he's doing his job to get his story out as he's waiting to get signed. And, and I think that all eyes on Brandon Ayuk is a good thing for once because you know Brandon Ayuk doesn't necessarily get the shine in this team, I think when people outside of the 49ers, 49ers organization look at this team, they don't necessarily look at Brandon Ayuk as the guy. They look at Debo. They look at Trent. They look at CMC. They're starting to look at Brock Purdy. They look at the defensive guys. Brandon Ayuk quietly is becoming their best offensive weapon or will be here in the next year or two. So I think he's just making it known. Like, listen, I've, I'm the best of the best that there is. I'm worth every dollar I'm about to get paid. And I think he deserves to put his his truth out there, right? Because what ends up happening is you have so many fans who side with the team no matter what, like their team first through and through. And at the end of the day, he's putting out his what he needs to put out because, one, we have fans calling him a diva, fans that are saying get rid of him. If he wants to sit out, get rid of him. Like that to me, it just shows like there's nothing. there's a bunch of fans who are going to side with the team even when the team's in the wrong, right? Like Brandon Ayuk has not done anything to warrant to be traded. He hasn't spoke badly about the team. He's just saying, I want to get paid. You guys pay Debo top money. I'm the best receiver on the team. I'm the fourth option at, at, re at in the receiving game. And I still hit over a thousand yards this year. He, I thought he was phenomenal on the uh, Ocho, the nightcap show. And he, he stayed super professional. He could have been, you know what? Kyle, what Kyle did to me wasn't right. He could have, he could have truly went and dug deep there, but he didn't. Took the high road. I thought, I thought honestly, Brandon Ayuk has handled himself like a true pro um, during the offseason. Yeah, you could put whatever you want on social media. Like to be honest, we saw Debo Samuel come out and say, "Hey, this is all in fun." We've seen other players do it and laugh. For example, um, Deion Dawkins from the Bills. He put out like, "Oh, I'm be I'm leaving leaving Buffalo." They freaked out. Like the fan, like they they're regular humans too, and I think that's what people forget. Like he has a platform where he could mess with fans, so he's gonna continue to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a troll job. The Dawkins thing was hilarious because then, like ten minutes later, he <laughs> extended with them. It was that was pretty good. I enjoyed that. 
but yeah, man, I, I think I think BAA is a consummate pro, and I think he's going to remain that. And that's why I do think that he is going to be a 49er and that he deserves to be a 49er. I do want to say this, though. Don't be like David. David watches on Twitter. All the cool kids oh. are over on YouTube watching Last Second Jeez. Sports or Clutch Gene Sports on YouTube. I'm just saying, I like you if you're on Twitter. You're not as cool, though, David, you in particular. All right. Brother Bob says, this show is already better than the old big show. I appreciate it, Brother Bob. I Brother Bob does that. not work. I guarantee you he's constantly watching every show. I love it. <laughs> he's getting paid, but he's not working. That's definitely true. <laughs> That's the life. That is the life. He's got it made for sure. All right. Let's talk about, you know, one of the things that we've been hearing is that the 49ers might be interested in trading all the way up as high as 13 anywhere from 13 to 19 to go get this mysterious player or two if they fall. Whoever those players are, that's kind of irrelevant. But the question I have for you, Marco, is this is a team that is trying to win now. Trading up doesn't guarantee that you're going to get an elite player. I mean, that's the goal. I think your chances are higher. But we've seen the 49ers blow this before, right? Like, there's no guarantee that because you're in the top 15, you're getting a very good player. So. If the 49ers are thinking of going that route, shouldn't they just trade for a proven asset that they know will help them this year? What are your thoughts? So, I mean, if they trade up to the to 15, they're going to try to go D-tackle to replace Tariq Armstead, and they're going to probably get a Javon Kinlaw. So it all just depends <laughs> on what, like for me, the way I look at it is, do you go and replace a player or what are you trying to do at 15? Is it a, a win now move? Is it, an offensive tackle like you truly know that this guy's going to be a day one starter then yeah go up and get him um but i i don't think a proven asset is going to work with the niners and the reason why i don't think so is you just mentioned 39 um un, un, unrestricted free agents right and i think that is the biggest thing in terms of if you do trade away capital whether it's a second rounder a first rounder you're probably going to need to give up more than just 31 because 31 is viewed as a second rounder for most teams. So is that player signed already? Is that player expecting a contract extension? For example, we could, we'll use Greg Newsom as an example, because I know teams have called on him and I've reported that the Niners have actually called on him. He wants another, he wants a new contract. Like he's in that range where it's time for contract extension. He wants to play outside at corner. Um, so I think that becomes a big factor with a bunch of expensive contracts and Brock Purdy coming along. I would truly rather trade up then tr then go get a proven asset because you're at least getting someone who's going to be cheap for the next five years, um, team control. And I think if you do get that proven asset, it doesn't really move the needle for you. It, is it, if it's not Patrick Sertain or an, one of those top, top, top tier guys, that guy is not going to move the needle to win a Super Bowl. Um, so I don't really think you can go out and trade for a proven asset that moves the needle to get by a Patrick Mahomes or a Josh Allen in the, and a, the Super Bowl game. So for me, I think it's, I would probably trade up, find that happy medium if you have to, um, even if it's for a receiver. Like if you truly think um, Brian Tom, uh, Thomas is an elite receiver, go up and get your guy because that essentially, when Debo, when you move off of Debo, it keeps Brock Purdy having elite talent around him. So if I had to choose, I would definitely trade up in this draft class. I wouldn't stay pat and trade a first rounder plus pit, other picks. Because if you don't hit on at least four or five picks in this draft class, your team's going to be in a very, very dark situation where you probably don't have Kittle, Debo, and now you're looking to scramble things together with unproven talent that are guys like Ambry Thomas playing for you, and that's a scary situation. Yeah, most certainly. If, if they did trade up, I mean, do you think that they would trade up for what we would hope that they're trading up for, which is somebody on the offensive line, or do you think that they would be going for more of a skill position type player? I think you, I think they'd be trading up for offensive line. There's no way you trade up and get a skill position player because if the Niners are in win now mode, you go get an offensive lineman. You don't go get a receiver. That receiver is going to be receiver three or four on your roster. And if Kyle decides to put him in the doghouse, like he did BA, geez, that guy meant it. He may never play this year. So like yeah. the reality is, is, you're not going to have a receiver start. Um, but if they do want to get a corner, I don't mind going up and getting, getting a corner. Like 
um, the the two kids from Alabama, Terry on Arnold. You got Kool Aid McKinstry there. I don't mind going and getting those guys if you if you really like them. Oh, we're gonna have a disagreement here a little bit later. I'm looking forward to this one. Okay, okay. I the the way that I looked at it was, I, I personally, and I didn't give this as an option, but I'll, I'll throw it out there, and then you tell me what you think. But, oh, see see how this works. He he brings up other yeah. options that aren't uh, involved, yeah, yeah. so he could be right. It fits his narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's listen. This is <clears throat> this is what you can expect going forward. So I just want you to be prepared for it. But <laughs> I. <laughs> If they're going to trade up, I think that they should probably try to trade for a proven asset. Now, that's that's easier said than done. That being said, I don't want them to do any of that. I would stand pat or move back. I would like to see them move back. Now, trading up, I think, would be great in round two, round three. But the way that you do that without giving up a ton of assets is you trade back, you recoup assets, you use those assets to move back up with your later second round pick or a third round pick or what have you. That's what I would prefer. So I guess the next question is, is all right, we have all options available. Trade up, trade for a proven asset, stay put or trade back. Obviously, we don't know how it's going to fall, but just on the surface, what would you prefer to do? How far are we trading back? That's a big thing too. Like, is it a team? Is it Okay, I'll give you an idea. I don't want to go further than like 37-ish. I wouldn't mind it because you could still get. I think you could still get a top guy like a Frazier. Um, I think Kingsley still might be there. I think so. Because yeah. I'm very high on Kingsley, so I think I'm staying at 31 to take Kingsley or Jordan okay. Morgan or whoever's there. I think Frazier. A lot of these guys you could take at 31 and be happy with because you have that fifth year option. So it's like, does that fifth year option mean something when it comes to extending these kind of guys? So for me. I definitely think about that. Um, I don't, I know a lot of people are like, oh no, I'd rather stay pat and draft someone. Um, that's not an off, not the eighth offense alignment. So if I had to choose, I'd probably stay pat because I like that fifth year option for some of these guys. Like you don't have to extend them as early. Um, moving back into the second round is great because you probably get another pick somewhere and you could be aggressive and trade back up. But I think since you already have 11 picks, you could still trade up. I think what they should do too is, hey, Elijah Mitchell, sorry, but you got to hit the road, trade Elijah Mitchell, get another sixth rounder, use that as ammunition to go up in the fourth round or fifth round. Um, so I would probably stay pat at 31 if I had to. Yeah, most certainly. Uh, yeah, I, I will. I will. It'll be probably squeezing it right up to the draft, but I definitely will. The only three that I've watched in depth right now are Caleb Williams. Michael Penix and Jaden Daniels. Those are the only three I've watched. So I want to watch. I want to watch a few more and just see see what's out there. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll give you my top. It'll probably be more of a top three, top five. I'm only gonna watch them, six or seven guys. So when you watch them, make sure you watch Michael Pratt because he's probably better than Michael Penix and Bo Nix. Like people were really? sleeping on him. Yeah, I think he's better than them. And like it's it's I think it's all more so the age factor at least for me the processing ability now Phoenix has a better he has better arm strength but man Michael Pratt he's a really good he's a really really good quarterback you know what's interesting about Phoenix uh, I'm a Pac-12 guy Oregon Duck fan Same. so when I watch Phoenix play live I liked him a lot Lo I mean you can go check my timeline I was tweeting about him like crazy. When I went back and watched this film, I didn't like him as much. I didn't like him near as much. So I don't know. I mean, I, I I don't know why that is. I guess. I mean, I do know why. I've got my notes, but it was a little bit surprising to me. I, I didn't. Uh, I thought I would like him just as much, if not more, and that was not the case at all. So, brother Bob says, LMAO clutch, aka Marco. I work from home with the computer. All right. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, that we've talked a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I, we've talked a little bit about this draft, trading up, proven asset, trade back. Just overall, what constitutes a good draft? You and I also discussed a little bit early on, you don't think that they've drafted well. And I said, hey, I think that's more of a perception thing. I think they have drafted well, but more so in the later rounds and not the early rounds. So the perception is they haven't drafted well. 
what constitutes a good draft in your opinion? If they were to nail this draft, what what two, three things would have to happen? I think for every draft you have, you have to come away. And when you have 11 picks, it, it kind of adjusts things, but you have to come away with at least three starters, at least. And, and, and whether it's a high-level starter, an average starter, they have to be starting caliber players for you. So for me, with in this draft class, even though you're picking at 31, I feel like the, the depth of this draft class is from rounds two to five. Like that's where you could eat and you could get your team to be so deep of a, of a roster. So I think the Niners have the luxury of those 11 draft picks to be able to move back up into those th- rounds three and four. Um, so for me, this draft class will be a good draft class. if They come away with a minimum three starters, but I think you could go five to six guys that are contributing for you within the next year. So not necessarily year one, but year two, they better be starting for you or at least high level backups. Not a guy like Drake Jackson, who, Hey, maybe next year he'll be good enough or a guy like, um, Ambry Thomas. Hey, well, he showed signs, but like, it's not those kind of guys or, or for example, Nick Zakel, right? They drafted him in the fifth round. Hasn't seen the field. Like when we go through the roster, they have a lot of players who just haven't seen the field. And I, I think, that's a waste of a draft class because, for example, now the Niners two drafted two linebackers last year and, and two tight ends. Those guys aren't in their plans for the future. Like they're literally thinking about going and getting guys to fill their spots. And I think that's the biggest like that. Those are a miss. When you take a guy in the third round who's a tight end who probably shouldn't have been a third rounder, if we're being honest, and you're replacing him year the next year, that's where I, I think constitutes a bad draft where you're you're replacing guys right away year one i think a good draft is someone who is a draft class where you have guys where you know they're gonna redshirt this year but next year they're either starters or they're high level backups for you you know i'll say this and and i'm gonna plug the fact that we are gonna be live for the draft the way we have been the last couple years i would say for the most part the reactions we've had on draft day have held true when they actually have hit the field and over the last couple of years and how these players have actually played, we were frustrated with guys like TDP. We were frustrated with Ambry Thomas. We were frustrated with, uh, with sermon. I believe we were frustrated oh, yeah. with Moody. We were frustrated with, uh, with, uh, what other picks? There were with lots Jackson, of, we were frustrated. Even with Drake Jackson, a couple of us, cause I know it was me, you and David, we were like, yeah. well, that's a, that's a solid pick. But it's up. It's an upside pick. It's not. It was an not the best pick, yeah. player, but it was an upside pick. So even though there's like, you're drafting upside rather than probably he probably was the best player available at that point. But it's just man, like it's just just to see how they draft and how they view players because the night I feel like the Niners fall in love with guys, right? And I think that's an issue going into the draft. You can't fall in love with anyone. You have to truly have a hundred guys that you like and or love. And the moment they fall in love is where they make big mistakes. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, to, to the point here, Steve-O, I mean, you're right. And it's not just Kyle's drafts. You've got to wait a couple of years on, on every draft. Really? I know what you're saying. There's guys that tend to red shirt, so you never know. But um, anyways, that was really more of just a plug of watch us on draft day. We're going to have a lot of fun. And I, I feel like our reactions have pretty much, yielded what we've seen from these players a little bit of that is luck but ultimately i think especially david and marco they i mean this is when they really shine these guys are we've got a group chat they're constantly talking about prospects like they've made me such a smarter uh football fan as far as these prospects and what they're going to bring to the table i'm a big quarterback guy so I know usually I know the ins and the outs of the quarterbacks because that's what I'm watching. But as far as like corners and defensive ends and all, they are giving me all the names. But I, I also want to throw this out there. He was fine. He was fine. But you need more than fine out of a third round kicker. He's the highest drafted kicker in the whole NFL. He's got to be more than fine. And unlike Robbie Gold, who had never missed a playoff kick, he's basically undefeated in the playoffs. Moody is defeated in the playoffs. He hasn't gotten a game without missing a kick in the playoffs thus far. So they've got to get better for him from him. They cannot have a repeat of what he was this last year. That's not good enough for a guy who's a third round pick. 
So and I think what's crazy is with with Moody is missing a big extra point in the Super Bowl that's not talked about getting it blocked like that's not talked about that's a lot of times it's on the kicker I don't want to go into special teams and stuff like that but isn't there an XFL kicker who Jake Bates who's hitting 62 yarders and looking like a legit kicker like is he in the XFL like what are we like I think drafting kickers is stupid back to back weeks what he hit like a 63 and a 64 yarder and they were both like walk off game winners (laughs) like dude this guy's He's got ice water in his veins. So, yeah, I I agree with that. There's guys that you can find. Look at Aubrey over in Dallas. He was pretty good. He was undrafted. So, yeah. As far as is what constitutes a good draft, I would say one impact player. That player doesn't have to be an all-pro, although the 49ers have seemed to get one of those almost every year other than last year thus far. But one of those guys has got to be like Pro Bowl-ish caliber. And then I I agree with you. I would say about four guys that are either spot starters, starters, or rotational guys like on the defensive line, you know, whether that's safety they're rotating in, good contributors on special teams. But they've got to come away with four or five guys in this draft that are making an impact for years to come, not sitting on the bench year one, year two, no idea who they are going into year three. We, we can't have that from a lot of these guys. So they've got to hit on four or five of these picks. One of them, in my opinion, has to be an impact player. And then the other three, four guys have to be able to contribute in some sort of fashion on a regular basis on Sundays. So that's what I would be looking for in this draft. And I think it's very capable to get that, that many players in one draft, especially when you have 11 draft pick. Like, yeah, it doesn't have to come. And, and I'm a fan of, going for upside on certain situations not necessarily drafting for need or drafting for anything like that like if you're in the first round and you have two guys and they're graded out the same but one has one's upside for example is likely a pro bowl player and the other guys is already at his ceiling but it has a higher floor go upside like that's where you that's where you get those better players but you're likely to bust on that pick but i'm all for it like for example drake jackson he was an upside pick, but I'm all for drafting him in that situation. It just honestly, the draft is, if we're being truly honest, it's a crapshoot for every team. Like it really is. It You're is. literally guessing on every pick. Yeah, I mean, Beal's going to get a chance this year. Him and Drake Jackson are going to get a chance as of right now, anyways. And maybe they draft a guy. They're probably going to draft an edge at some point, and then he'll compete as well. These guys are going to have their chances. We're we're going to know coming out of training camp, and that's why I'm excited to go to camp this year, Marco. There's a lot of younger players that have been drafted over the last couple of years. Two years ago, we had Womack, and we had Drake Jackson. Last year, we had Beal. We had the Law Twos and Willises. We had the linebackers, Jalen Graham and Winters. We're going to see if any of these guys are going to be able to contribute. And we'll I think we're going to know pretty quickly if they're, they're guys or not. So I'm looking forward to training camp this year for those reasons. Who is going to even make this team? I don't know. We're going to figure it out, though. We're going to figure it out. All right, assuming the 49ers stay at 31. We've talked about trading up. We've talked about trading back. Give me, and we'll, we'll just go back and forth. Three players each that we think the 49ers should avoid at pick 31. I swear, if you say Kingsley at all at 31 that they should avoid, I will no longer record with you because I know you're up to something where you're going <laughs> to piss, like try to piss me off. So I'm just letting you know right now, uh, if you say that, I'm done. Um, but for my first guy, I'm going with, uh, it's a guy that a lot of Niner fans like and a lot of Niner fans want, Tyler Guyton. Don't, don't take him at 31. I, I think Tyler Guyton is overrated. I think Tyler Guyton is one of those guys where he has high upside, but he's also also super duper raw. You could, your pause. You could also go with a guy from Yale, the kid from Yale. I think that would be a better pick in the later rounds with the same upside, same athletic traits, same uh, everything. The people were falling in love with Tyler Guyton because of his frame and his size. I'm way Tyler Guyton. I think. His weaknesses, he's way too, plays way too tall. He lunges way too much. He's, his head is always over his uh, knees and toes. Um, hasn't really played much. Injury concerns. I truly don't like Tyler Guyton as a prospect. 
in the first round. And and it sucks to say it because he he absolutely does have high upside. If he hits on his upside, good pick for whoever takes him. But you better have a great offensive line coach, a great system for him. I would have seriously avoid Tyler Guyton. Well, I'll give you the spoiler alert. Kingsley's not on my list. Tyler Guyton is on my list. He is wow, on my list. That's crazy. So this is and we, we and we don't talk we about didn't we didn't talk about, about any no. of this though. No, nope. we come that's up crazy. with topics and then we go do our own thing. So I want to I want to see if, if we can get two out of three. That's pretty impressive. I know one of them you're not going to have, but you might have two of these guys. I'm I'm impressed. Tyler Guyton, I I agree. He's newer to the off- to playing offensive line. He was a defensive end, I believe, coming out of high school and then transitioned to offensive line in college. And he's he's just a raw, really good athlete. Big. I mean, he all the measurables he fits, but he's still raw in the position. And that's exactly what I put here. There are guys that I value just as much mid to late second round that are quote unquote lower prospects. Kid out of Yale is a great example of that. So I agree. I would avoid Tyler Guyton at pick 31. I'll give you my second guy, and let's see if he's on your list. Number two is Chop Robinson. Bro. You got him? I swear to, I swear to, I swear to God. I swear. <laughs> All right. Since we're, since we're two for two, I'm going to give you my third guy. And then we'll both talk about chop because if we have if we're three for three, we're we're insane. not. I know I know for a fact we're not because you like you okay. really like this guy and I like this guy as well. But there's a reason that I say no to him. But get g- give me uh, give me your third guy just for S's and G's. My my third guy is Cooper DeJean from. Iowa. I knew you were gonna say that. I and I almost did. I almost did. And I was like, you know what? If I go with Cooper, we're gonna agree on that one. Um, but I have a I have a corner as well. It's Kool Aid McKinstry. But we're oh, going to wow. talk about it. Yeah, we're going to talk about it. So let's go Chop Robinson first. Here's what I said about Chop. I said he's inconsistent. A lot of the same things as Tyler Guyton, actually. Inconsistent, raw athlete with only three sacks in his final year. I believe eight his final two years. He can be a major boom. I'm not saying that this guy's going to suck by any means. I would rather, though, in my opinion, Marco, I would rather have him hit and be really good on another team then take the chance and have him be a bust on the 49ers. I, I don't know if there's anything in between. He's either a boom or bust guy. He gives me major David Ojabo vibes. What do you think? I think when I watch him, there's nothing to it besides speed. No counters, mm-hmm. no strength. It's just pure speed. And when I it, to me, as an edge rusher, if you don't have not even a counter move to your speed or speed to power that you can convert on a consistent basis, you're not going to win like that in the NFL. What team, what offensive linemen are going to start doing is they're going to start setting and they're going to have a kick that's wider and they're going to counter to the inside move, which is a quick little, like a, if you were talking basketball, it's like a little hezzy outside crossover inside kind of move that he uses. It's not mm-hmm. going to work in the NFL. His, when you watch him at the senior bowl, he dominated, but he wasn't dominating against the top offensive tackles at the senior bowl. He was beating the lower level tackles that were there trying to make a name for themselves. So for me, I truly don't think he's a guy that is going to be that boom guy. I think he's going to be in the range of maybe a four sack guy a year, maybe higher upside. Kind of like, for example, you know remember that week one game where Drake Jackson went went crazy. Everyone was like, oh my God. And, and I came out and I was like, dude, those are all hustle stat sacks. I think Chop Robinson is going to be a hustle sack kind of guy. He's not going to beat you at, at right off the snap. Now, he has a quick burst. I love his his first step. That's probably his best attribute as an edge rusher. But outside of that, hands, short arms, cannot fight with the hands. And that's going to be a very big issue when you're starting to, to face strong NFL offensive linemen who, as soon as they get their paws on him, he's, he's screwed. And it's, yeah, he said, go be great for another team. I'm not taking that chance because it's sort of a similar pick to Javon Kinlaw, where essentially is there's high upside, but there's a very raw talent there. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I want to say Trap Robinson also had injury concerns. I could be wrong though. Yeah, I just that's so funny that we had two of the three. That's crazy. That's if we have even one guy that matches as far as our sleepers go, uh, that would be impressive as well. But 
Yeah, man. Uh, Chop Robinson. It, it seems like every year there's one or two of these just freakishly athletic edge rushers that come out and almost never do they hit. They just never hit. They've got to, you've got to have some polish to your game. You've got to have counter moves and, and things like, like Bosa, very good athlete. But Bosa isn't near the athlete as a lot of these guys, but he was so polished and so technically sound that you knew he was always going to be good. And if he improved his strength and his athleticism, which you've seen, then he would be even better. But he always had the technical skill set to move, counter move, counter move the counter move. These guys are coming in and they're just blowing past offensive players most of the time not good offensive tackles and they look phenomenal on film and then their RAS score is extremely high because they're freak athletes they have all the measurables size weight speed all the things but they're raw and they just never truly develop and you said Drake Jackson I mean yeah kind of kind of like Drake Jackson actually Drake Jackson has all the measurables that you want but he was a raw athlete, and we've seen that it already hasn't panned out. So that's funny. We both had Chop Robinson. Give me why you think Cooper DeGene, and then I'll tell you why I think Kool-Aid McKinstry is a guy to avoid. Because when I watch Cooper DeGene, it's, I like to be able to watch a corner where my secondary coach and my defensive coordinator don't have to be in strictly zone coverage. When you watch Cooper, he's a zone coverage corner. He, butt to the sideline, cover four, cover three, a lot of cover two at Iowa. Like that's to me, like I want to see you get up in a in a receiver's face, play some man coverage, press man, or even press bow. Um, and he doesn't do it. Like it's very limited. And then when you watch him, very good athlete, but he's tighter hips for being six. I believe he's only six foot. I thought he was a bit taller than that. That's why I thought he would had a little bit tighter hips. Not that big of a, a corner. I think he he is likely gonna move to that safety role. Oh, where he's going to be that strong safety, big nickel role um, in the slot for zone coverage. And I think that's the biggest thing is if I get a corner who I agree, Fozzie, Blazers are going down tonight, uh, go Warriors. Uh, but okay, if I'm getting a out. corner, <laughs> if I'm getting a corner, I need him to be able to be where we're not handcuffing our defensive coordinator. For example, our defensive coordinators have guys who could play man. But they instead of using playing man coverage, they run a lot of zone. It's like, no, get up in the in the receiver's face, make life difficult. You have a good defensive line, and let's go to work. And I, I see if you go a strictly zone corner, when you do go man, you're in a tough situation, and I'm not doing it. Yeah. Let me let me ask you this because a lot of people project him to be a safety. I know he he did a little bit of everything. For me. The reason I was going to put Dejean down is because of that. When you played one position primarily and then they project you somewhere else, that's a little bit worrisome because you can't, you don't see it enough to know if that's going to translate. I'm not saying it won't translate, but I like to see it on the field, play for play translate. And you can't really see that with him. But, but there is some thought that the 49ers might go and try to get a star defender. Do you think he could fit that role potentially? If we're going to go get a star defender, why not go get a guy like Jordan Hicks or um, a true safety where like at that point, it's like, if we're going to go get a, a true star, like I don't think Cooper, the jeans, the best safety in this class to be that star role. Um, I would go get a guy like Jordan Hicks, who's much better as a safety um, or Bo braid from maryland um there's a lot of other guys you can get in that what second if or third what round. if what if they drafted a true free safety somebody that can roam and, and play single high do you think that either of the guys on the roster currently and huff or tig can play that star role in your opinion i think tig tig or huff would be phenomenal for that star role i think they yeah. would i think tig is actually better suited for it. i know a lot of people were like let's let huff be that that star role but i think Tig Brown would be better suited in that star role, roaming around, doing whatever he gets to decide to do and and pick it, pick his poison. Uh, but if you're looking for a true safety out of USC, uh, Kalen Bullock, I believe, I believe that's the name. I know his last name is Bullock. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. Phen I, I, people keep talking about, oh, he misses too many tackles. Man, I'm asking him to be a ball hawk and take away the deep 
third of the field or take away a, a half of the field. I'm not asking him to come down and tackle in the, along the the box. Like no, that's that's not his role. Like I don't get why people mention how much he misses tackles and it's not even at a high rate. Yeah, it's uh it's funny because I asked you that's this is what I do. Like I get into the process really late, and then there's a couple guys that I fall in love with as prospects, and then I'll just ask you like, hey, I'm 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 liking this guy all of a sudden out of nowhere. Am I tripping? And then you and David will basically say, yeah, you're tripping or no, you're not. And that's a, that's one of the guys that I presented to you recently. And you're like, no, no, you what you're seeing is absolutely right. I mean, this guy can handle himself as a single high safety, absolute athlete. Yes, maybe a little bit small. I get all of that. But what you would ask him to do, I think he can fit that need at a very high level. And that's he's the opposite of what they have. That's what they need. They need somebody who is a true opposite to what they have, and he's exactly that. And you could probably get him at in the third round, and he's, I know people, like, he is a smaller, I guess, smaller frame in a sense, because he's only, like, 185, 190. But he's, taking, six, he's got two, a corner frame. He's got a corner frame. Yeah, but at 6'2", you could, you could add an extra 10, 15 pounds and not lose that athleticism and fill out into your grown man body, and I think he's, he's not going to have an issue with that at all. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this was the difference that we had, although we both had a corner, which is still pretty dang close. I had Kool-Aid McKinstry, not because I don't believe that Kool-Aid can be a good player. I actually do think that he probably will be pretty good. But the way that I look at this draft, I think round two, round three, there's a lot of value. Even into round four, there's a lot of value at the corner position. And the difference between a Kool-Aid McKinstry and a corner you're going to get in round two or round three, I don't think is near as big as some of these other positions. Like, if I was in a draft a player in the secondary, I would say, okay, go get Guyton. Because the difference between him and some of those safeties, I think is a bigger gap than Kool-Aid and some of these corners. I think some of these corners might end up being first-round talent, even though they're the sixth, seventh, eighth corner off the board. And you add in that he had the injury, the Jones fracture, I think anytime you have foot fractures or foot injuries, especially at a position like corner, it's always a bit of a red flag because cleats just aren't designed to hold explosive body weight when you're pressing constantly, running at full speed, coming to stops. So receivers and corners specifically, when they have foot injuries with the way cleats are designed today, that worries me a little bit enough to where I would say, ah, I'll let somebody else take Kool-Aid and maybe he's phenomenal, but he also might have foot problems for the rest of his career. And I would prefer to avoid that. And that's, and that's totally understandable because you're not, you're not necessarily saying avoid him because of the player, avoid him because of the no. injury concern and the, the, the margin between him and a guy like Max Mountain in the set at the end of the second round or trading back up into the second round isn't that big of a gap where it's like you gotta take him. So it's, you're not saying he's a bad player, which most people know he's not. But a guy like TJ Tampa, um, compared to him trading up and getting him, like it's, I get it. Melton, you know, I mean, there's some guys. So I love Kyrie. I listen, Kyrie Jackson's older, but athlete for athlete i mean i i don't know that, that he's much different you know I, I don't know that he would be much worse and you probably get him for sure late round two maybe early round three late round three depending on how this board falls because he's older so some teams might avoid him for that reason so there's there's guys out there there's guys out there that that i like okay With, that was kind of crazy two for three on the guys to avoid now i don't expect that to go this way when it comes to sleepers. But we each have three sleepers. And what constitutes a sleeper is not a guy who's not a first rounder. We're talking true sleepers. Round five or later. Guys projected to go in round five. Now, obviously, maybe somebody's in love with one of these players and they creep up a draft board. But guys that we expect to go round five or later, maybe even potentially undrafted, depending on who the prospect is, but we each came up with three of them. I'll go first on my first one, and then you can go number two. Number one for me is a running back, Kamani Vidal. I love this kid, man. Every, I mean, 
I really liked him early on in this process. Five foot eight, 215 pounds, absolute tank. You look at some of his scoring and his testing, especially in the 20 yard split, the 10 yard split, the three cone, very comparable to Maurice Jones Drew. And also very comparable as far as size to Maurice Jones Drew coming out of college as well. Now, I'm not saying he's going to be Maurice Jones Drew. That's not what I'm trying to say, but there is a lot of similarities there. I think he's a powerful runner, decisive runner, low center of gravity, solid balance. Almost every time he gets the ball, the first player misses. He either sidesteps him, runs through them, whatever, but he always makes the first person miss. He's also solid in pass protection, which a lot of rookie running backs, that's something that they have to develop. I believe that's something that he has right out the gates, which you look for. Uh, look for, and then he's the leading rusher in Troy history. I know Troy's not the biggest college by any means, but for me, Kamani Vidal is a player that I really like in this draft. For me, it's uh, an offensive lineman. It's actually center to be exact. And okay, uh, I think this guy. So going into the Senior Bowl, he's played in the SEC, uh, had a really good career, but then goes to the Senior Bowl, and one play kind of is how people look at him now. Like, so he's the player who got walked all over by Tredov uh, Tidra Tivandre Sweat, mm -hmm. um, Bo, Bo Limmer from Arkansas um, center. But when I look at that play, I'm like, this, it sucks that he's getting killed for this because one, he is not that kind of guy. He has true strength. Um, he just got over overpowered by a dude that has maybe 550, not 550 pounds, 60 pounds heavier than him. Um, which most dudes who are going up against a bull rush one on one is probably going to get bulldozed by that kind of guy when they have 60 pounds over him. Um, good in terms of outside zone, uh, has a good anchor, um, very smart IQ football player. I think that's the biggest thing for me is a center needs to have IQ, a center needs to be as smart as a quarterback. Essentially, your center is the fat quarterback, like it's essentially what, <laughs> what they are. They, they could truly see coverage from where they are. They could call out the blitzes, especially in Kyle Shanahan's scheme where he lets his center call call protection. And I think that a Bo Limmer would be a great fit for a guy like um, Brock Purdy. So that's, for me, I think every time I, I could get the chance to draft them in a mock draft in the fifth round, six, sometimes you may get them in the sixth round every once in a while, but usually fifth round. Um, I think he goes a little bit earlier. I know a lot of people are projecting him to go in the fifth round, but based off of everything that I've seen and my grade on him is a third round grade, but based off of the projections from, and this is me projecting, like grabbing the projections from the consensus that people have him as a fifth rounder. So for me, I'm taking Bo Lemmer in the fourth round if I can, because I'm not letting him fall to that fifth round. That's how good he is. And he's probably going to go fifth round. Absolutely love it. Okay. And I, listen, if we can get an offensive lineman, I'm all for it, especially one that you think is worth it and could potentially be a starter for this team. I, I'm all for that. So fixing the offensive line, I'm on board. Player number two for me, Christian Boyd, defensive tackle out of Northern Iowa. Six foot four, 317 pounds, violent hands, does not get stuck on blocks at all. <laughs> Plays with good pad level for his height. I mean, six foot four is. Pretty pretty tall defensive tackle, but plays with very good pad level. And I love that he has experience. He played in 50 college games. We, we talked about why the 49ers should avoid Chop Robinson. Well, he's not refined. He's just an athletic freak. Christian Boyd, I think, is very refined as an interior player defensive tackle. And we've seen the 49ers find success in these later rounds for these fat daddies, I like to call them up the middle. And I think Christian Boyd could be another one of those guys. The 49ers right now, you look at their future at the defensive tackle position, I think it's a bit in flux. Why not add another guy to compete and potentially take a job away from one of these backups? Christian Boyd, I think, could be that guy. He's another one of my late prospects that I like a lot. Give me another one of yours. What's crazy is I almost went Christian Boyd, but I didn't. Um, shout out to okay. Steph Sanchez who actually interviewed him. Um, okay, she put me on. Like I, I, she interviewed him. I was like, dang, like let me go and watch him. Dude, dude's a stud. Like he's legit. Like one of those <laughs> guys stud, where, right? Yeah, he's a stud. Like it's, 
I don't think I don't think he makes it to the fifth round or sixth round where he's people have him going right now. I, there's no way that his tape shows he's a baller. Um, my, one of my sleeper guys is I don't know if he goes earlier um, just because of the situation. Um, and I know a lot of people have him going in the fifth round as of now. Um, for me, this guy is a receiver. Um, he reminds me of Nico Collins, uh, okay. Cornelius Johnson. Um, I think Cornelius Johnson has the athletes there. It's not a refined route runner, but again, you're taking a guy in the later round. You're not going to get that route running ability. You're, you're going off of upside potential, um, a little bit older, but at the East West Shrine Bowl game, shout out to the East West Shrine Bowl who allowed me to get access to film, um, reached out to them and they gave me some film, um, as a credentialed guy whatever but they gave me the film and he was the guy who stood out the most out at the receivers there and there was a lot of guys who stood out at, at in the receiving room i truly liked what i saw from him um you're getting a guy who ran i believe a four four five six foot two in the fifth round i'm taking the upside because the extent he can block as well yeah. now jennings Jen, remember jennings is six foot three six foot two four seven speed Imagine replacing Jennings in our offense with a similar blocking style kind of guy with speed. Like that's essentially what you're getting opposite of Brandon Ayuk. Um, I think he's one of the more slept on receivers in the draft class, but this draft class is stupid deep. It's like crazy. It's so deep. Yeah, it definitely is. So it's funny that you went receiver because I also went receiver with my last sleeper pick, Anthony Gould. Spelled like gold, like Robbie Gold, but it's pronounced gold. Uh, wide receiver, Oregon State, five foot eight, 174 pounds, so very light frame. Ran a four three nine forty, but had a one four nine ten yard split in a forty inch vertical. Here's the biggest thing about him: when you watch him play, dude is not afraid of running in traffic whatsoever. For a guy that size, you're like, okay. You know, he's going to get absolutely killed. Well, phenomenal at following his blocks is something that shows up repeatedly on film. Like I said, he's not afraid and going over the middle. And you give him a contested catch, he'll go up and get it. He's got a little bit of Steve Smith in him where it's like, I don't care how small I am. I'm going to go get the damn thing. And a 40-inch vert, yeah, he can make some plays. He's got great body control. Uh, I forget who the quarterback is at uh, Oregon State, but... You, I think it's a DJ Ugalele or something like that. Uh, not very good at all. Constantly off target with his throws. This man makes acrobatic catches look routine. Played outside primarily, although he's going to be a slot in the NFL. Get him on the move. You don't want to get see him get jammed at the line. But the fact that he played outside tells you that he's got a lot of toughness at his size. And here's the best thing. Phenomenal punt returner very explosive punt returner also good at the end of rounds you get him the ball just get the ball in his hands like i said he follows his blocks very good and because he has a one four nine ten yard split on top of four three nine speed guess what new kick return rule you gotta love it he's gonna get momentum going all these other players gotta stand flat-footed till the ball is in his hands and then he gets up to top speed faster than almost anybody yeah i think that that's worth a risk in round six or seven i'll take it Anthony Gould out of Oregon State. Did you know he returned a kick in the East West Shrine Bowl game? I did not. A punt, actually, punt, punt, punt. Returned the kick, returned the punt. Um, and it was beautiful. He had a nasty spin move during that punt. I'll have to send it to you after the show because you're mentioning special teams ability. And he was one of the guys who stood out at that, that, that bowl game. And what's crazy is a lot of people actually with Anthony Gould thought he was going to go skyrocketing when DJ got there. Like, oh, DJ has a rocket arm. As long as he can just throw it out there, but DJ is yeah. inaccurate, so it's, he can't really totally utilize that speed. Um, my last guy is a tight end who probably could become the best tight. I shouldn't say the best tight end in this class because people are going to use that and run with it. Could be the one of the top tight ends in this draft class. Um, I think Eric All um, out of Iowa, and not because he's from Iowa, he's at Michigan before. Um, it's kind of rare you find a tight end who is versatile could be your y f or h back um it's rare you see tight ends be better route runners than against zone like 
against zone, he actually struggles. Like he runs into the man in zone. Um, he's really good at yards after the catch. Uh, very twitchy off the line of scrimmage. Uh, I think his best ability is going to be his route running and his uh, stretching the field. Um, now, and there's one tight end too. Now, the the reason why he's going to fall is because of injuries. Um, mm. That's for me. It's if he's if he's healthy and like Otani interpreter says. He's all as the injured reserve all star. Like if he is healthy, he is a dude, and the reason why he's being slept on or he's a sleeper pick um, is because of the injuries. No one really knows who he is. I think from at least what I've seen on social media um, is because of the injuries. But besides that, hell of a player. Yeah, he's really good player. And again, I don't have an issue taking a flyer on somebody who, if they weren't hurt, is clearly a much higher pick or prospect than what we're talking about here. And if it doesn't work out, if he's injured, no harm, no foul. Where you don't take flyers on injured guys is round one, two, and three. That's not what you want to do there. And that's why I put Kool-Aid McKinstry on my list as guys to avoid at 31. Uh, Curse Black says, how do you guys feel about Cooper DeGene from Iowa? We actually had a, a pretty... Long conversation about Cooper DeGene. Um, go back about a half an hour. We talked about our guys to avoid at 31. Marco had him as a guy to avoid at 31. So a little bit of a spoiler alert, but we talked in depth about it. Marco, we made it through show number one together. Not bad. I'm not that much of a jerk, I promise. I don't know about that. People don't know. Yeah, you yeah. The, uh, uh, I was waiting. Know. I was waiting. I was say, I don't know. You guys want to know how this guy really is. Uh, let me tell you. But so my show, since we're doing a dual stream and everything, mm -hmm. I tend to ask people and I don't mention it to them. I don't ask them what they're going to be asked. I don't tell them what they're going to be asked. Um, okay. Well, hold on. First of all, just, just because I'm controlling things here, if I don't like it, I'm just going to end the stream. So if the stream just ends abruptly, you'll know why. All right, go ahead. But I usually make sure it's a good question for the person. Like, I don't know. Okay, yeah, I'm sure, not going to ask you what color nails you're going to paint. You know, like, it's not <laughs> what I'm going to ask you, um, which I don't Clear. mind. People are weird about that. But um, UFC 300 is uh, this weekend. Yeah. And I know you're a UFC fan. Um, yeah. So I have to ask you about UFC 300. Who are you going with in the main event, uh, Alex Pereira or Jamal Hill? Oh, my God, dude. This is. <laughs> Man, this is going to be a barn burner. First of all, this is if it's it's interesting because one of the questions that I ask people that are MMA fans, I say, if you can show a fight to somebody who's not privy to MMA, what's the fight you would choose to show them and why? And a fight that I always talked about was like um mcdonald versus lawler like that's just one of those brawls that you just oh my Go god at it. they just stood toe to toe that should make pretty much anybody fall in love with the sport so those are the fights that you're looking for i could see this fight going down as an instant classic like that i, I really could now ultimately somebody's going to go to sleep but i could just see it toe to toe war for two three rounds one of those fights that is like oh my gosh that's why this fight is headlining ufc 300 i know it's not like the crazy name the big name whatever but this fight is an incredible fight at least on paper we will see um i i gotta go with the proven guy i gotta go with uh Pereira. but man we're gonna find out we're gonna find out what uh jamal hill is made of because he's coming off this achilles injury but he was on a tear up until that point. He just might be that guy. And I, I will say this, maybe not as much at 205 as he was at 185, but Pereira can be a little bit chinny, and he can be a little bit upright, and he is there to be countered. So I wouldn't be shocked if he goes to sleep either. But I will go with uh, Pereira because I think it's a safe pick. And I think what's crazy about this fight is you're getting a dude who wants to come back and prove himself versus Pereira mm -hmm. who... He's proven himself, but he he also has had where times where he's gotten knocked the hell out. And mm -hmm. for me, I think Jamal Hill is going to come out with a vengeance. He's going to come out swinging, and like you said, the way Pereira fights, he 
his shin gets out there sometimes. He leaves his shin there. So for me, man, UFC 300, the card is phenomenal. What's even better about UFC 300 is the undercard. The undercard, <laughs> I feel like the undercard is almost better at like than most UFC cards. Like that's to me like this. So that's why I had to bring it up. Like, who do you have in the main event? Obviously, we're not going to see Max Holloway versus Justin uh, Gage Gage Gagey. Um, but Charles, Charles Oliveira. What, what, what happened? Well, hold on. Unless I'm, something happened today. Was it, was it not? I know canceled? that it was canceled. Sworn. It was initially canceled, and then they brought it back onto the thing. So oh, they brought it back. It's canceled. Yeah, if you're reading okay, that it's okay. canceled, that's that should be old news. But even that fight, that's going to be bombs away. They're going. They're standing in the middle of the freaking the octagon, and they're going at it, man. This for me, I'm super excited about UFC 300. Um, these guys are going to go toe to toe. Most of them are. Undercard is going to be phenomenal. But I had to ask you because I ask everyone usually on my show a random question that has nothing to do with 49ers related because at the end of the day, it is a podcast, not a sports podcast, but, um, no, that was a great question. See, I didn't end the stream. So, you know, it was a good question. So I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Marco, thank you so much, man. This is show number one. Uh, and what should be an awesome show heading in through the off season and into the season, looking forward to more of these with you and show number three happens to fall on draft night, which we will be live for that next week. I think we'll be heavy mock drafts with you and I. So spoiler alert, we're going to do some mock drafts leading into the final week of the draft. That's what you can look forward to next week. And I think for the most part, unless some news breaks, probably going to chill for the rest of the weekend. Marco, what do you have going on over at Clutch Gene Sports? Anything? Yeah, so Friday Friday is our is our day with Ashley Ariana. Um, if you guys okay. don't know Ashley Ariana, she uh, has a podcast on her end and everything. So we're probably gonna record tomorrow. Um, I might do a preview, like a I'm um, so my pot my show is gonna start adding extra sports topics. Um, obviously the NBA playoffs is about to start, so I might do a quick little preview of. The Warriors, um, obviously, the Warriors are about to whoop on the Trailblazers today. If you guys didn't know yeah, that, cool. They're Jesse's from getting Portland it knocked area. out of the play in, so that's great. Good they're for them. One of the hottest Dynasty's teams in over. the NBA. So, I mean, are they not? Like, <laughs> they are, but so, they're not gonna, they're probably not even going to make the actual playoffs. But go ahead. I mean, anything's possible with Steph. You're not wrong. They might not make the playoffs, which is <laughs> which is true. Which I love how you just like to kill people's dreams. There's probably a yeah, kid watching no, no problem. who wants to see Steph Curry in the playoffs, and you just broke his heart. Fine. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, listen, you just talk <laughs> trash on the Portland Trailblazers. So, uh, what if there's a Scoot Henderson fan out there or an Aiton fan? You don't know. Hold you on, have no idea who's no, watching. There, there ain't no Scoot Henderson fans out there. Let's be real. <laughs> All right, listen, this is <laughs> this is the time to end the podcast. This, You know what? Great first show. Might be the last one. We'll see next week how it goes. Thank you, everybody who contributed in the chat. Much love, as always. Have a blessed rest of your evening and weekend. We'll talk soon. Peace.